Hi, uh, yes, my name is Anna. I'm going to talk to you about CatBoost today. CatBoost, a gradient boost, Cat, CatBoost is a gradient boosting library. Uh, uh, it's in open source. A few days ago, I think on 18th of July, we had our first birthday, so we are one year in open source. Uh, one day before that, we reached 3,000 of stars, and I was really, really happy about that. So the project is growing. We uh, Make, we have made many releases and we are working on the project actively and uh, many people start to use the project. Uh, so first of all, let's start with the problems that we are trying to solve using this library. So uh, gradient boosting is a machine learning technique that works well for heterogeneous data. There is homogeneous data like images, sound, video, text. Uh, for all this data, you need to use neural networks to get a good result. Yeah, sure. Yes, okay, so uh, with neural network, uh, for those kinds of tasks you need to use neural networks. And there is structured data, uh, like for example for predicting credit score, if the person will uh, pay the credit, you have a table of the data where each uh, row is a, a person and each column is a feature. And those features do not have that much internal structures between them. Like in the image, two pictures near each other have a lot of internal structure and here you do not have this situation. For this type of data, gradient boosting usually gives the best results. Uh, the next uh, thing is it's very easy to use. Uh, you can use a gradient boosting model actually as a black box model. You uh, give to gradient boosting your data, it trains the model and gives you a good result. You cannot do that with neural networks because uh, you really need to be an expert to build a good architecture. And it also works well if you have not a lot of data. And that, that is something that happens many times in life, that uh, you do not have huge amounts of labeled data. But gradient boosting will still give you good, good result. Because of this whole set of reasons, it's used in production in many companies. Uh, it can be used in finance for predicting credit scoring, for example. It can be used in recommendation systems for understanding what are uh, the, best, uh, mus uh, the best songs that uh, the person will like, uh, or it can be used for sales predictions. It is also used heavily on Kaggle. There is uh, the uh, There are many machine learning competitions, and for this type of data, the winning solutions in many cases are based on gradient boosting. Uh, now, neural networks are very powerful, and it would be really cool to use neural networks together with gradient boost boosting, and that is something that we are doing in Yandex. So, Yandex is a very large Russian company. We do search, uh, we have taxi, we have self-driving cars, we have many, many different, it's like a Silicon Valley of Russia. And uh, what we are doing for many tasks, we are using together neural networks and gradient boosting. For example, if you want to, uh, if you have a query and you want to select, to, uh, select uh, images to show to the person, then you first calculate neural features on these images, then you combine these neural features with other knowledge that you have about this image. For example, uh, about the site on, on which the image was, and, and then these features you give to gradient boosting. So it is a good idea to combine those methods. They're, they are not contradicting, they can work very well together. Uh, gradient boosting is an iterative algorithm. It works like that. It usually builds decision trees. First it builds one decision tree so that the training error is large. Then it builds another decision tree so that the training error reduces. And then it does that for hundreds or thousands of times so that the training error is very small and you already can find complicated dependencies in your data. That is about gradient boosting. Now about CatBoost. The main thing, uh, so the main reason why you should be interested in CatBoost is on the slide and it's quality comparison. Cat, uh, there are several uh, libraries in open source. There's our uh, LightGBM and main competitors are LightGBM and XGBoost. There is also the H2O algorithm. And as you can see on the slide, uh, here CatBoost wins uh, on the set of publicly available data sets, all these libraries by different amounts, sometimes by really a lot, like on Amazon. Um, and that is the comparison after parameter tuning. Like you have, you have the algorithm, you need to tune parameters to get the best quality. Uh, this is after parameter tuning. We also have a comparison without parameter tuning. And CatBoost with no parameter tuning beats all other algorithms on these data sets with parameter tuning, in all cases except one where LightGBM outperforms uh, CatBoost by a little. So uh, that is a quality comparison. It's a good reason to try the library. 
Now uh, I will deep dive into the differences between CatBoost and other libraries. The first difference is the kind of trees that CatBoost is building. Different libraries or different algorithms build different kinds of trees. LightGBM builds trees node by node and can get very deep, not symmetric trees. XGBoost builds uh, trees level, layer by layer, layer and it, the trees cannot get very deep, but they are not symmetric. CatBoost builds symmetric trees. An example of the symmetric tree you can see on the slide, and that is not an error on the second level. The feature is the same, it's the weight on the second level in all the nodes on this layer. On the next layer, if the tree would be deeper, there would be four nodes with the same feature. Uh, this type of trees, uh, that is, uh, we observe that this type of trees uh, helps a lot with uh, hyperparameters. So, uh, because when you are using this type of trees, the, uh, the resulting quality does not change by a lot when you are changing the hyperparameters. So the algorithm is stable to hyperparameter changes, and because of that, it gives very good results from the first run. So you don't really need to put a lot of effort into parameter tuning. You can, get, you, you can make sure that uh, the algorithm has converged, so you, you had enough iterations, and then you just uh, get the first, the first uh, model that the algorithm has given to you. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, that is uh, about hyperparameters, and the next thing about is about prediction. With this type of trees, uh, the prediction can be done very fast, and I will talk about this later. So that is the first difference. The second difference is the type of data that we are able to work with. There is this numerical data, like height or weight, or like numer numerical features, and it is clear how to work with numerical features if you are using gradient boosting on decision trees. You put uh, a feature into the tree, and if the value is less than something, then you go to the one side. If it's greater than this value, then you go to another side. So this is the way to use numerical feature in decision trees. It is not that obvious how to use categorical features in decision trees. Categorical feature is a feature with discrete uh, number of, uh, with disc uh, discrete set of values, where values are not necessarily comparable with each other, each other by greater or, or less. An example of that would be occupation, or there could be examples with high cardinality categorical features, like user ID, for example. And the high cardinality categorical features is the, are the features where it is the hardest, uh, where it is the hardest to work with them in an optimal way. So how do, what do we do with categorical features? The first thing that we are doing is very simple. It's one hot encoding, and that is something that other libraries also do. Uh, in, what is this? Instead of uh, one categorical feature, like occupation, uh, that a person is a manager or a cook or an engineer, you have three binary features. Is the person the manager? Is the person a cook? Is the person uh, in PR or what was the third thing I said? So uh, instead of okay, one categorical feature, you have many uh, binary features. Uh, you could do this during the preprocessing, but if you do, do this during the preprocessing, then your data set grows, you, you have a very large data set, and also the training time will grow by a lot. So the good, uh, the good way to have uh, one hot encoding is to let the algorithm do one hot encoding for you. So you just say, this is the categorical feature, please do one hot encoding. And the algorithm does it for you, it will be better in terms of speed, and it also will be better in, ter in terms of quality. Uh, for, then there, there are details uh, of, of the algorithm that allow for that. I don't uh, have enough time to explain everything. So the first thing is one hot encoding. Other libraries also do that. And, and then we have this whole set of things that we are doing with categorical features that are more, more sophisticated. And these things give a very large boost in quality. So one hot encoding we do for features that have little amount of values. For high cardinality features, we do the following. We do calculate statistics based on label values uh, of, of the objects with this category value. The simplest thing you could do is the following. Let's say you have this data set that we have on the slide. And uh, there is this categorical feature that is occupation with two possible values, software development engineer, SDE, and PR. Now, instead of one categorical feature, this categorical feature, we introduce one new numerical feature, 
that is equal to average label values of all objects with this categorical feature. Instead of uh, SDE, we will have three divided by four. Uh, it's the average label value. There, there are three ones and one zero. The average label value is three divided by four. This is called, called target encoding. This could work, but the problem is, is it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it leads to overfitting, because it leads to target leakage. An example where you can understand that would be, let's say you have the single object with a category value. Like you have in this data set, you would have only one SDE. Then this SDE will have a label value one, and your new numerical feature value will be just equal to your label value. So during training, the algorithm remembers that it has a very good feature that is equal to target, and it makes all decisions based on that. But during the prediction, you will not have this magic feature that is equal to label. Because of that, you should not do this. But what are we doing? We're doing the following. We are doing a random permutation of all the data. And now the data is permuted, and you are looking on, on the object with uh, some categorical feature value, the ETH object. And now you are calculating the same uh, averages, but not including this object. You are only looking on the object before this one in this permutation. So for this object, the new feature value will be 2 divided by 3, because there are three objects uh, with uh, categorical feature value SDE before this one. Now, what else we can do? We also can use priors. For the first object, you don't have any objects before this one, so it will be 0 divided by 0. To, to not have these problems, we introduce priors. We add a prior in nominator and numerator and denominator, as you see in the formula here, and it, it gives a boosting quality to try different priors and to try to find out which prior is a good one for this particular feature. So what we are doing, we are calculating those averages. We are enumerating different priors. What else you could do? You could try different random permutations. But you cannot use uh, two random permutations to train one model, because it will lead to target leakage in the same way as the average on all data set. What you can do, and what we are doing, you can train simultaneously several models. We are training simultaneously four models, and on each iteration, when we are selecting three structure, we drop a coin, select one of those models. Each model has its own permutation. So we select one of these models and one of these permutations. For this model, we select the tree structure. When, then, after that, we give this tree structure to all four models that we have. And then we calculate leaf values based on one more permutation. This gives a, a good high uh, boost in quality, and important thing is you cannot do this dur during preprocessing. That is on something that you only can do if you are writing the, uh, this inside the library. The next thing you can do, you can look on feature combinations. Uh, what are categorical feature combinations? You, let's say you have two categorical features, uh, a pet and a color, and your new categorical feature that will be a combination of those two features will have the following values. Blue cat, black cat. Blue dog, black dog. So it's, a, it's an, uh, a new categorical feature that is a combination of features. The problem here is if you have uh, several categorical features, the number of possible combinations grows exponentially with the number of features. So you cannot really uh, calculate those statistics for each combination. What we are doing inside the algorithm, we are enumerating combinations in a greedy fashion. So we do not enumerate all of them, but we are trying to enumerate through some best of them. When we are building the next tree, we first, on the first level, we try only combinations of size one, and then we, on the next level, we are trying combinations of size two by adding uh, features to the feature that we have already selected. And we also calculate other statistics like frequency of the category in the data set, it also helps. That is uh, the big thing about categorical features. Now, the next thing that we are doing that gives boosting in quality is called ordered boosting. Classical boosting is prone to overfitting, and that means that the resulting model will lack in quality. And that is because when you, are, uh, so when you are building the tree, when you are building the uh, leaf value, the leaf value is the estimate of the gradient of all the objects that would be in this leaf. And this estimate in classical boosting is biased. 
um, because you are making this estimate on the same objects that you have built the model on. It is easier to see if you look on the error. If you are trying to estimate the error in the leaf, if you estimate the error uh, on the same objects that you have built the model on, then the error will be less, so it will be biased. The same thing happens with gradients. To overcome this problem, we use the same idea that we have used for categorical features. We use these random permutations. Now you have your random permutation, and when you are building the tree structure, then for each object, you are making the estimates based on the model that has never seen this object. You, you are making the estimate based on the object before given one in the permutation. And that gives a boosting quality in case if you uh, are in case if you have small data set or noisy data set, in case if, if you know that uh, there might be overfitting, it really helps. Okay, now I told you about the main algorithmic things that we have in the library. Now let me tell you about the modes that the algorithm is working on. There are three main modes, classification, regression, and ranking. And that, those three modes are in all uh, gradient boosting libraries. First one is classification. And there are binary classification and multi-classification. Binary classification problem is, for example, if you want to predict if the person will pay the credit or not. In your training data set, you will have labels. One, if the person has paid the credit. Zero, if the person has not paid the credit. Or you might have probabilities there. And for multi-classification, multi-classification is when you have uh, more than two possible answers. For example, if you want to predict weather for tomorrow, you want to predict type of clouds, and there are like six or nine possible type of types of clouds, and for that you can use multi-classification. Uh, the regression is when you want to predict a numerical value. Uh, for example, if you want to predict taxi drive duration or to predict dollar exchange rate. Those are regression problems. And there is also ranking, and ranking is a little bit more tricky. An example of ranking problem would be for this particular city, like say Edinburgh, give me top end hotels in this city. Let's say that your input data has ratings. So for each hotel, you have a rating and you want, uh, for some hotels, you, uh, it is your training data set. And for prediction, for some hotels, you do not have the ratings, you need to predict the ratings first and then rank uh, the hotels and select top n of them. How you would solve this problem? One way to solve this problem would be to solve this using regression. That means you really will try to predict a rating for each hotel, and then you will sort hotels by a rating and select top n. But you don't need to do this. In this case, uh, let's say in city A, all the hotels are really good. In city B, all hotels are really bad. And what you're trying to force your algorithm to do is your algorithm will try to say that in this city, all hotels are worse than in this city. And that is, that is uh, not cheap. And you don't need to do this to understand top end here and top end here. You don't need to compare them with, with each other. So you don't need to, uh, to learn the real rating. And because of them, what you are doing, you are grouping the, uh, you are grouping the objects into groups, like here you will group the objects by the cities, and you are trying to rank objects only inside each group. That is ranking. Uh, we use ranking a lot in Yandex, because we have search, we have ads, we have recommendations on music and video. We have very many places where we need ranking. And because of that, we have very, many very powerful ranking modes, which XGBoost and LightGBM do not have. The first one, let's say it's just ranking, is in case if you have something like ratings in your data set, or relevance as if you have a search query and the documents, and then for each document an assessor will write a number which will be a relevance of this document. That is ranking. We have uh, two modes for ranking. They are called Yeti rank and Yeti rank pairwise. And uh, the difference between them is that the first one is really fast and the second one is really powerful, but slow. In most cases, we use Yeti rank pairwise. The next mode is called pairwise mode, and that is the mode uh, that you use if you do not have any ratings. Uh, in, you only have the pairs of objects, and for each pair, you know that uh, first object is better than the second object, third is better than fourth, and so on. So you only have pairs as the input. We have two modes for pairwise ranking, and the difference between them is the same. And we also have three other modes. One is the mix between ranking and classification, 
which might be useful if you want to do ranking, but you have uh, the zero and one labels as the input. Another is ranking plus regression. And one more is uh, specific for the task when you want to select top one best candidate. Uh, that is also a ranking task, uh, but there might be the case then when you don't, you are not really interested in top n, you only are interested in top one. So we have this whole set of ranking modes, and if you are interested in rank, I, I would strongly recommend you to try them. They work really good, and they are used in production in different services in, our, in Yandex. Okay, now, uh, what else? Uh, we have talked about the uh, algorithm, how it works. We talked how to use it, which modes are there. Uh, now about the speed. The important things are CPU speed, GPU speed, and uh, prediction speed. CPU speed, when we just released, uh, Catboost was really slow, and everyone told us that, and we worked a lot to make speed ups. And currently, the situation is the following. On most of the data set, we will be two to three times uh, slower than LightGBM, so LightGBM is the fastest one. And for, uh, for with XGBoost, we might be the same or by two times slower, something like that. So the difference is not that much, but we still are a bit slower than other libraries. With, with GPU, the, the, the situation is completely different. We are very, very fast in GPU. We are 20, uh, about 20 times faster than XGBoost and two to three times faster than LightGBM. And the important thing is that CatBoost is super easy to use as opposed to Light, LightGBM. A cat boost is easy to use as opposed to light GPM. You just pip install the library. There is a flag uh, task type equals to GPU, and you use it. So it's really fast and it's really easy to use. Um, important thing about GPU is that GPU speed up uh, comes with amount of data. For the, the more data you have, the more is the speed up. For very large data, if you have millions of objects, you will have the speed up up to 40, 50, 40 to 50 times. Um, and even on, that will be on US GPU, on, on older GPU, the speed up will be about four times. Uh, about prediction time. Uh, we care about prediction time also, and uh, CatBoost prediction time is 30 to 60 times faster than XGBoost and LightGBM. It's not that everyone cares about speed up, but we, we, are, we care and we are proud that we are so fast. Uh, and, uh, also, I wanted to, to mention a few other things, uh, and that is how to explore your model. If you want to understand uh, your, what your model is doing, you, you need to look on feature importances, so which feature are the most important ones. You can look on feature interaction, which pairs of features work really well together. There is also per object feature importances. Uh, for this object, which feature are the most important? Uh, for that, we, have, uh, we are using the shop, uh, shop values, and there is a shop value library that shows the visualization for that. So for uh, each feature has uh, the importance, it, it might, might have positive importance, because of that the, the cost, because of that feature the cost grows, because of that feature cost is lower, and so on. Uh, there are different plots you can, you can uh, look on uh, to understand more about your features. Uh, there is also the way to understand what objects are the most important ones. So let's say you have this object and you want to see because of which objects in the training data set uh, the result is the following. There is influential documents for that. And that there is also a way to understand the importance of the, if the feature is uh, important, if the feature influence is significant, statistically significant. For that we have uh, feature evaluation. We have tutorials for all of that, and I recommend you to look into these tutorials. Uh, there, are, there is a bunch of different features also in the library, uh, except for uh, training. There is uh, a, a lot of visualization. You can look on how your uh, error changes during training using a uh, Jupyter Notebook, using a separate CatBoost viewer, or using TensorBoard. Um, you can also uh, tr try training uh, on data set with missing features. You can use cross-validation. We have also visualization for cross-validation that is also running inside Jupyter Notebook. So there is a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, stuff to try. Uh, yeah, and I just want to mention a few important parameters. So if you 
wants to tune your algorithm, if you want to get the best quality, these are the parameters that you want to tune. Uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, the tutorials how to tune uh, and documentation how to tune parameters for quality. We also just published the tutorial how to, ch how to change parameters if you want to get the most of the speed. Uh, I, I encourage you to look into this uh, documentation. Uh, yes, and here are a few links. Uh, the, the last one is called uh, GitHub Cat Boost Tutorials. And we, we also have published there a tutorial, like a tutorial with homework. So if you want to try how to, uh, want to learn how to use gradient boosting, uh, you can try this tutorial with homework and uh, do the tasks there, answer the questions. And we have the tutor tutorials for all the functionality that, that I told you uh, about. So if, if you run through these tutorials, you will learn everything. Uh, and with that, I am ready to answer the questions. Questions from the audience? By the way, can I, can I also ask the question? How many of you have uh, heard or used CatBoost before this talk? OK, that's half, half. OK. Hello. Hi, thanks, thanks very much for the talk. Um, so you mentioned at the start that it's possible to combine neural networks and gradient boosting. Yes. Uh, can you give us some uh, example so, applications? Or yes. So, so um, we, first of all, we have a tutorial how to use uh, uh, neural networks on text together with gradient boosting. The idea is the following. You train a separate neural network, for example, uh, a neural network that will uh, say, that will compare the image with text. And then from that, you get a numerical features like distances. And those distances you combine with other features. Like you have the image and you have a lot of other information about this image. Uh, not only what you see in the image, you have information from the site, from how many people clicked uh, there, and so on. And then you combine this all together. And then you put this into gradient boosting. OK, thank you. I have a question about the, the categorical like, features you mentioned. Uh, how did you use those? like the statistics when you do prediction, because you don't know the so, true value. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question fully. So how we use those statistics during training? During prediction. Ah, uh, during pre So what we are doing, we are reading the training data set. And we, for each cat category that you have seen, you have a value that is calculated based on all the training data set. Then you write this value to the hash table. And when you are predicting, you are, you, you, um, what you are doing if, is you are adding this test object to, to the end of your training data set. And then you, the feature value for this object will be the average based on all the objects before given one. That means uh, on all the training data set. And this is the value that you have saved in the hash table. So basically you use the average value of the training data set. Yes, exactly. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk and for the library. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, why would you use SkyKitLearn um, anymore if you have something like this? Like, do you have any application? No, uh, SkyKitLearn has a lot of a lot of stuff, including gradient boosting. Yeah. Uh, gradient boosting, uh, all all uh, like CatBoost and LightGBM and XGBoost work better than SkyLearn uh, gradient boosting. So if you want to use gradient boosting, you, be you should better go with a different library than scikit-learn. But there is a bunch of stuff in, in scikit-learn that is very useful. Oh, yeah, that's true. But uh, like for anything like predicting category, uh, like classification, regression, and all of this, you would only use CatBoost at Yandex, right? So we, we, use, we use CatBoost for many, many different tasks. Uh, I don't think we are training any SKLearn classifier for, production, for our production purposes. 
Oh, thank you. But we not only use gradient boosting. There, there are other also useful algorithms. There are neural networks. There are, I don't know, linear models, uh, nearest neighbors. We, we, we use all of that. But gradient boosting is a, like a very important algorithm. Hi, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, is, do you have any tools within the library to extract the prediction path of a particular instance, similar to a tree interpreter for a random forest? Uh, could you repeat, please? Um, so when you make prediction for a given instance, is it possible, do you have some tools to extract the path to the, this particular instance took to make that? Ah, like the, uh, for, for each, uh, what, yeah. what path in what each? What were the important features So we are to... currently, we are currently working on the, on providing the JSON model, and uh, that will be uh, the way f to, to discover the paths. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, how well do you integrate with sklearn? Because I've been using Xgboost for ranking problems, and it's insanely hard to not use the basic XGBoost thing if you want to do cross-validation or anything with ranking. So how well do you integrate with the rest of the ecosystem or do I have to use CatBoosting all the way? Yeah, so, so we are trying to integrate as best as we can. We are, we are very much compatible with XGBoost, so if you are already using XGBoost, it will be not that hard to switch. Uh, there are some methods uh, like um, I don't remember, there was some method that, uh, so we do not support all the methods in sklearn, but uh, we know about one of them that does fail and we plan to fix it soon. And if you see anything that doesn't work, you can just uh, make the issue on GitHub and we will fix it. Thank you for your talk. Uh, do you have any experience about uh, applying CatBoost to uh, natural language processing um, use case or data sets? Yes, so for natural language, uh, language processing, is what we do, we usually use neural networks. And uh, for, we, we sometimes do on top of what, what, we, are, what we are using, uh, doing using neural networks, we do use on, that, on top of that some gradient boosting. For example, we have, uh, we have the dialogue assistant that generates uh, the answers, so you, you ask uh, something, then there is this neural generator for the answers to the, uh, of the assistant to you, and it generates many answers. And then on top of that, there is a re-ranker uh, that is uh, based on gradient boosting that extracts some features from each of the answers and then re-ranks them. But the core, oh, the core is usually based on neural networks. Thank you for the talk. Uh, in production, we use neural networks and LightGBM. A couple of months ago, we uh, tried to use CatBoost, and basically our use case is we, we create word embedding, some other features, uh, and one hot encoding, and then we pass that to LightGBM, and we spend a lot of time uh, fine-tuning LightGBM. <sighs> but when we try to substitute with CatBoost, it so the results weren't better. So how easy is it is to, to fine tune CAD boost? Do we need to spend again two months in uh, grid search and so on? Any yeah, ideas? So it, it should not be, uh, so uh, there is a set of parameters that you can change to try to improve the quality. And those parameters I listed here, it's here. Uh, so you can try to fine tune these parameters. Two of them, uh, okay, one of them learning rate and iterations. You don't really need to fine tune, you just need to, you, you need to find this point of convergence. And these other ones, you probably have to fine tune. With, with depths, the situation is the following. You don't need to enumerate through all the depths. Uh, you only, you basically try the depth six, that is the default one. And for some data sets, it is important to have bigger depth. So you try six, you try 10, and then if, if 10 is better, then you, you need to fine tune between eight and uh, nine, something like that. Uh, so th those uh, are things to fine tune. Uh, yeah, uh, and one more thing about one hot encoding that, that you told. It might lead to a slow uh, training uh, in, for CatBoost. 
So if it is possible for you to not do it during preprocessing and to give the algorithm the possibility to do it for you, then it uh, will be probably better. And about word, no, one more thing about word embeddings, it usually does not work perfect if you uh, give the word embedding to gradient boosting in a row, like, like this 300 uh, numerical features, you give it to gradient boosting. Usually it's better to try to find some distances yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, I don't uh, do ML as a part of my day job, but I've used uh, CatBoost as a key ingredient in uh, many of the ensembles in machine learning contests with great success. So thank you for that. Uh, so my question is related to the previous question. Do you have any tips on uh, hyperparameter optimization? Uh, so I mean, the usual recommendation is grid search. Uh, but uh, usually uh, use something a little more intelligent when it comes to optimizing uh, uh, hyperparameters so for neural nets and things like that. Any, anything on those lines for Yeah, there, there is the hyperopt which works better probably. I would recommend this library if, if you have uh, Yeah, I, I incidentally use hyperopt for uh, uh, neural nets. Okay. So you, is that what you'd recommend for uh, parameter tuning on cat boost? I, yeah. It's not particularly for cat boost, it's like for Yeah, it's, it's quite generic. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for a nice talk and for open sourcing the library. Uh, I have two quick questions. One of the bullet points you showed previously was that the uh, library handles missing values, which yes. essentially means you can feed in the NAs without, without yes. imputation. Yes. Which is very useful, yes. And the other question is, do you support Parse matrices as input yes, that for is the one thing that we do not support yet, okay. and we are currently working on that. Okay, so this so, is some, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the next plan, <clears throat> the plan for the next few releases is the following: we are we are uh, will be adding the sparse metrics support. We are adding the Spark, uh, the distributed training on Spark. We are also working on that, and we we are adding multi-classification on GPU. It will come really soon, and. We are adding uh, the JSON model and improve, yeah, in improvements in our package. That is the plan for next releases. Right. But sparse data is a very long, uh, it, it's a very large uh, thing to do, so it's not yet uh, ready. But we, we are working on that. Perfect. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I found the quantile regression option in gradient boosting quite useful for my applications. So do you have uh, something similar in cat boost, which could provide the prediction intervals? Do you have what? Uh, the quantile regression option. Uh, yes, we do a quantile. We have a quantile regression. So you could derive uh, prediction intervals based on that? Uh, you, we do not provide prediction intervals, uh, no. But so, so there, there is the, a loss function for quantile regression. Yeah. But there are no prediction intervals. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. If anyone wants to have the microphone. Yeah, one there. And I am very open to feature requests now. How well it handle uh, imbalanced data? So uh, it, there, there is always a problem with imbalanced data. We have the possibility of reweighting the objects, uh, scale pos weight parameter that the same for XGBoost and LightGBM. Uh, but we do, that is the only thing that we are doing specifically for uh, imbalanced data sets. So it depends. Uh, we, we know some data sets, some imbalanced data sets where it works really good, like Amazon, that, that was there on the slide, and some data sets where it does not work that well. Because your trace, trace structure are balanced, right? It's like yes. very sensitive to imbalanced data. Then, right? um, I, I don't think that uh, this, uh, uh, this tree structure uh, is worse than other tree structure for imbalanced data sets. Okay. So, okay. 
but but we we know that there is uh, this problem with imbalanced data set, and we are trying to figure out how to find this. Other libraries also do have the same problem. Okay, thank you. We have time for one last question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about those parameters there. What do bagging temperature and random strength represent? Yes, okay, that is a very good question. Uh, the uh, bagging temperature, so, so the, when you are selecting the tree structure or when, when you are selecting the next tree, you are doing some bagging. So what you could do, you could do uh, Bernoulli sampling. We select some objects and do not select some other objects, but you also can do other sampling. What we are doing, we are by default in uh, regression and uh, classification, we are sampling from exponential distribution. And what we want to do there, we want to balance between having no sampling at all and having sampling from uh, exponential distribution or heavier. And this begging temperature, changes that. So if it's set to zero, then all the weights are equal to one. If it's set to one, then you have sampling from exponential distribution, and there is this balance. The random strength is uh, one more parameter. When we are selecting the tree structure, we are trying to, to put an, a split in the tree. For each, each possible split, we are trying to put in the tree. And this split, this split gets a score. And this score is uh, how, good, uh, how, how much uh, this split improves uh, my ensemble. What we are doing, we, we are adding to this score a random and normally distributed random uh, variable. And this random strength is the multiplier for this variable. And this helps a lot to overcome overfitting. That is uh, one more surprising hack that, that helps to improve the quality. Okay, uh, I want to thanks Anna again uh, for this enlightening talk and thank you very much for the audience. <laughs>